I'm a product of the public school system. Went to Brooklyn College when it was free. We should go back to that kind of a system. In 66, I went south. They always said to me, oh, here's that Yankee. And I said, no, no, I'm a Dodger fan. Got me about 10 seconds before then they got really annoyed at me. And I went to Edwards, Mississippi in 66. It was part of a program called the Law Student Civil Rights Research Council. And during that week in training, I realized that all the things that I was taught, the pledge, liberty, and justice for all, wasn't true. I then worked, after I finished law school, NYU Law School, 68 and 72, in the ACLU Southern office, dealing with the Southern Civil Rights Movement. And in Lamb, 66, 67, 68, I had the privilege of going every once in a while to Ebenezer Baptist Church on Auburn Avenue. I heard, first of all, the church was Daddy's camp, was in Martin's. But I had the opportunity on various occasions to hear Martin speak. He was great. We don't have anyone like him. Obama comes close in his speaking, but no one was like Dr. King. And I got religion. I also met people like Ralph Abernathy, Anita Blackwell, Andy Young, Hosea Williams. These were advocates. They weren't lawyers, they were advocates. And then I came up south, back to New York. And up south, it's more subtle. It's more sophisticated. I don't have to lecture to you, you know better than me. But it still exists. What are we talking about? We're talking about the legacy of racism. In the Cotton Club in 1926, they put the cabaret laws in. Why? Because they didn't want people of color dancing with white folks. Until 51, in this city, in clubs and restaurants, blacks and whites couldn't come together. That is an important historical point. When I become the public advocate, we will have a deputy public advocate for issues of race and class, sexual orientation discrimination. We will begin a long overdue and important dialogue about race relations. In the South, it was relatively easy, black and white. Most of the whites were white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. In New York, it's black, it's brown, it's red, it's yellow, white. And most white folks, they don't identify with race, they identify with ethnicity. So the issue is so much more complicated here, but we gotta take it on. I was there for the Lima. I was there on Doris Mann. I was there on Diallo, and I'm the treasurer of the Amadou Diallo Foundation. I was there for Sean Bell. I've been there and will continue to be there. A public advocate should have a civil rights mindset, not a career politician. The people who is in the public advocate's office should not, and I tell you tonight, I don't want to be the mayor. I don't want to be the mayor because it's a different skill set to be an advocate as opposed to be the mayor. And it's the only office I run for. If I had been the public advocate already, we would have had 50 town hall meetings about what happened to Professor Gates up in Cambridge. We would go to the issue. Can it happen in New York? Better yet, has it happened in New York? I got a man right here, the Imam, one of my clients, one of the people I respect. When they went after him, because he was speaking out, his mind, not even on the job, they wanted to punish him. He had a First Amendment right to be in Arizona and say what he said. That's what a public advocate does. They fight for people who speak the truth. They fight for people who stand up, who are outspoken. They don't go after people who are quiet. They go after people who speak out. That's what you need a public advocate for. We'll have a whistleblower unit. You all know if you speak up, there's retaliation. But if you know your back is covered by a public advocate, you'll speak up and you know better than anyone what's going down wrong. Furthermore, I do FOILs. And you know in the city government, the higher you go, the more Caucasian it is. Where are the blacks and Latinos on the bottom? Listen to this, and Billy Thompson, if he's around, listen to his people. When you take a look at the affirmative action policies of the Bloomberg administration with regard to promotions in city government, it is worse, worse than you know who? Rudy Giuliani. Could you believe that? But that's true. And when Bloomberg decided to arrest 1,846 people during the Republic National Convention, I went to court with other lawyers and got a habeas corpus to get the people out and hold the city in contempt. Other people closed their eyes to what was going on. If I had been the public advocate, that would not have happened. And now there's 600 lawsuits, and who's paying for it? We are. You can change the dynamic. You can bring people together. We will decentralize this office. We'll have an office in every borough, and on Wednesday night, 6 to 8, Saturday mornings, 11 to 1, we'll come to buildings like this, at 163 West 125th. We'll go all around the city and we'll have people who do intake, who listen to people's complaints and be their advocate, and then we'll take on the systemic issues. 
I'll create an institute of advocacy to train people to be advocates. What I learned in the Southern Civil Rights Movement, again, you don't have to be a lawyer to be an advocate. All you need is a big mouth. And I got a big mouth, and you got a big mouth. And finally, I'll bring it to a conclusion. So there's a little levity on this stuff. I will also have a public advocate annual doo-wop concert. Freddie Paris and the five statins singing in the still and nice. Cousin Bruce has already agreed to be one of the MCs, but I want to be Alan Freed, and I want to do that too. And just, I'll end it on this though. Some people think doo-wop, oh, you're off the wall. But think of it. If I used to sing out the Teller Island Street Corners in Brooklyn, you got African American, Latino, and Caucasian people singing a cappella. And what are we doing? We're harmonizing. We need more harmonizing in this town. I will build the bridges. We will bring people together. We can overcome. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Many of the proposals, the, the offices, the staff, the unit, uh, cost money, and we're in an era right now where the public advocate budget has been cut severely. How would you handle that? The premise is wrong. It doesn't cost money. When you want to decentralize the office, you go to every borough president and say to them, give me a room. Why will they give you a room? For free, because you're serving their constituents. And then when you do the studies, when you do the reports, and you hold the press conference, what do the politicians love most? They love standing over there in front of the camera and putting their face there. I have no problem, let them be the star for the one day gig. All I want to do is get the results and get the change, change the status quo. With regard to, when I was the head of the Civil Liberties Union, we had a budget of $900,000. And we were out there fighting all the time, especially against the Giuliani administration, against the Koch administration, sometimes even against David Dinkins when he wasn't doing what we thought he should be doing. You get volunteers. If you have energy, if you have charisma, if you have skills, you can energize people to come and give you a few hours a week. When I talk about doing the intake, it'll all be volunteers. When I talk about the Institute of Advocacy, it'll all be volunteers. We'll tap into the law firms and get pro bono lawyers who will represent people for free. If you create that excitement, it's contagious, and people will come, and that's the spirit of the Civil Rights Movement. Okay, final question. What would you do about the policy of 